All right, today we're going to talk about nine sources of comfort. The first one that we're going to talk about is God the Father. So number one is God the Father. Okay, and you find this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. If you've got a Bible, open it up and we'll study together. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Okay, the Bible says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So there's four things that we want to notice by these verses alone. The first one is that God is called the God of all comfort. That means that all comfort comes from God. The God of all comfort. Now, number two. The Bible says the God of all comfort, verse four, who comforted us in all our tribulation. So he comforts us in all of our tribulation. What do you think about whenever you think about tribulation? Hard times? Hard times. That's a really good answer. You know, most of the time we think, you know, because we're thinking about the Bible, we think about the tribulation, you know, whenever God's wrath is poured out on earth. But the reality is, is that it really is more general than that. In the generality, he says, um, in the Noah Webster 1828, it says, severe affliction, distresses of life and vexations. So number two is that he comforteth us In all our tribulation. Okay, and remember, think about this in the context of the distresses of life. Life is hard. Life is hard, and what the Bible says about the God of all comfort, our Father that's in heaven, he comforteth us in how many of our tribulations? Oh. All of them. Okay, but what if we don't feel his comfort? Is he still doing it? Yeah. He is. You know, many of the things that God does, in order for us to actually feel it or even receive it, we have to be paying attention. But this is what God does whenever you're... Here, if you're feeling the distresses of life, God is, he comforteth us in all of our tribulation. All of it, not some. Every time that we're feeling the distresses of life, God is offering his comfort. But we don't see that because many times the distresses of life overcome us. And we go to other things to be comforted. So, Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8. In the same, in the same place, we're going to find out what Paul is going through whenever he's explaining that he comforteth us in all of our tribulation. Read verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure of strength, and so much that we despaired even of life. Pressed out of measure. We're not, we're not talking about somebody who may or may not be of a weak spirit. Paul is easily probably the strongest Christian that ever lived. And he said that he was pressed out of measure. He was pressed beyond measure. And he did what? He despaired even of... Wow. Ever been there? Mm -hmm. Despaired? Even... 
of life. Life is hard unless you live in a pipe dream. The Apostle Paul knew what it was like to despair even of life. And in this, he says that he that the God of all comfort comforteth us in all our tribulation. Don't be deceived to think that just because you cannot feel God's comfort, that he is not coming for you in when you despair even of life. I believe he puts this in there for a reason. Obviously, Paul was a strong-spirited person. There are many people that are much weaker than Paul that have been in this, in this scenario. But the reality is, is that this tribulation, you know, we have a tendency to think that tribulation has to do with persecution. And it can. But we get discouraged whenever we read this. We say, well, I'm not suffering for Jesus. Therefore, God probably is not comforting me in all my tribulation because I'm not suffering for the right reason. That's not true. He despaired even of life. He said they were pressed with about um, above measure and that this tribulation is the distresses of life it can be those other things but if you make it those other things you're never going to realize that god's trying to comfort you so he despaired even of life now um this thing also said and this it said vexation this is vexations this these tribulations can be vexations what do you think about whenever you think about vexations being or troubled from the outside, from external force, but I'm coming at you. Yeah. Check it. So, so go to Second Peter ver chapter two, verse seven. This is the most famous time that the word vexation shows up in the Bible. Second Peter chapter two, verse seven and eight. Seven and eight. What's that say? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Okay, so this, okay, so then this tribulation and this, this distresses of life and these vexations can come in the form of having to deal with evil too. He said, in seeing and hearing. Well, it's like, what are we dealing with in society today? We, we feel like everything's getting more and more evil. The reality is, is that the devil's been running the joint from the beginning. The veil's just being pulled back, and now we're able to see things that we weren't able to see. But the reality is, is that we're being vexed from that end also. And that's 2 Peter chapter 2. Verse 7 and 8. Verse 7 and 8. Okay? So he comforts us in all our tribulation. you got to understand, and you cannot be an adder or a remover of the word and say that it should say some. The way that you... The way that you... One way that you can feel the comfort of God is just by taking him at his word. Doesn't mean that whenever you're in tribulation that it's automatically you're just going to feel the comfort of God. But you're not going to feel it if you feel like you're the exception. He said all and he meant all. He comforts us in all of our tribulation. Now, look at, um, now go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And... Verse 4, he says, Who comforteth us in all our tribulation. And then he says, this is our third point on this. He says, that we... What's that say? What verse is it? Um, chapter, verse 4. Of what chapter? Of chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort 
wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Okay, so this next phrase, he says, comforteth us in all of our tribulation, okay? He makes a statement about who God is and what he does. Now, then he, said, then he gives us a one of the reasons why he comforts us. One of the reasons why he comforts us. He obviously comforts us so that we will be comforted. But, he says, that we may be able, able, okay? So the implication is, is that we would not be able to comfort those that are, um, what did it say? It said, um, to comfort them which are in any trouble. You would not be able to comfort anybody without the fact that God is a comfort to you. So this is one reason why he, in all of our tribulation, um, comforts us. Able to comfort. I'm going to say others. Okay? So that we may be able to comfort others. One thing that we'll notice in the Bible is that many times the reasons why, that one of the reasons why God does things to us and for us in our life is not so that we would hoard his amazingness for ourself, but it would rub off. See, so he, one of the reasons why he comforts us and we are comforted is that we will be able to comfort others. Now he says, number four, in this verse, all this is in that, those two verses. He says, by, so we're able to comfort others by, what does that say? The comfort wherewith. We ourselves are comforted of God. So by the comfort, okay? Okay, he comforts you. Then you are able to comfort others by that same comfort. So what happens is God comes to you in the distresses of life, in the day or days that you despair even of life, and then by that same comfort, then you're able to give it to somebody else. We'll get to it. I will, I'll just make a note. Don't ever feel like you're unqualified to bring comfort to somebody. Many times it, it is, it's a balance as far as what we should say, what we shouldn't say. But don't ever feel unqualified because if we've been comforted, that enabled us to comfort others. And we comfort people by the comfort that he comforted us with. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 6. Second Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 6. What's it say? Nevertheless, God, that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Okay, two points here. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 6. God that comforteth those that are cast down. Okay, so God. Who does he comfort? Those that are cast down. Okay, so if you or anyone you know is cast down, guess who's coming for them? God. God, who comforteth those that are cast down? Notice he says comforteth. That means that he is comforting. He will comfort. If this happens, he's coming to comfort. Just like he said, comforteth us in all our tribulation. Have you ever tried to be a help to somebody and they didn't want your help? It didn't take away from the fact that you tried. They could be like, I don't want to hear what you're saying. But you tried. God is coming when you are cast down. He's coming. And if you believe the word of God, this will help you whenever you are in this distresses of life. Or when you despair even of life. Because if you know, he really is coming for you. And he's making every attempt to comfort. Any questions so far? Okay, so then... 
what's the last part of that verse? Um, who um, comforteth us? Comforted. Comfort, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Okay, so he said, God comforteth those that are cast down. Then he says that um, God himself, right? Comforted by... The coming of Titus. So then, who does God use to comfort people? That's right. So then, and we're going to get to this. This is a separate source. But, <clears throat> talking about nine sources of comfort. Now, the second one, does that make sense? So the second one is the Holy Ghost. You find this in John chapter 14 and verse 6. John chapter 14 and verse 6. John chapter 14. No, it's not right. 14, 16. He says, and I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may... Abide with you forever. So, the Holy Ghost is called the Comforter. You know, I don't know if you've thought about this, but whenever people don't have a proper bed to sleep in, they don't typically have a Comforter. It's easier to sleep whenever you have a Comforter. And it just so happens that whenever we realize that the Holy Ghost that lives inside of us is actually our comforter, it'll help us rest a little bit better. So that's John 14 and verse 16. Um, look at verse 26 in the same chapter. What's that say? But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Okay, so there he says, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So, again, he's the Comforter. Now we're just going to nail this home a couple more times. Chapter 15, verse 26. Chapter 15 and verse 26, the Bible says, When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. What did he call them other than the Comforter? Even the... Spirit of truth? Bam, okay, so then this Comforter is called also the Spirit of truth. Of truth, okay. Okay, he says, You have not received the spirit of, I got that. Spirit. You have not received this, yeah, okay. All right, so this comforter is classified as the spirit of truth in opposition to. 1 Timothy 1, verse 6. We'll hold our place there. I'll go over to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6. And he says, oh, it's 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6. It's not verse 6. It's verse 7. He says, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Okay, so this spirit of truth that comforts us is in opposition to the spirit of fear. Okay, so fear doesn't come from God, that's a different spirit, and the spirit of truth comforts us and alleviates fear. So it's opposition. Now, last one on the comforter, he says in chapter John 16, verse 7, 
Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So that's 16 and verse 7. He says he's going to send the Comforter. So, the Comforter comforts us. Now, where's the Comforter live? Inside of us. Yes. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What is so great about this comforter? 619. 619. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19. What does it say? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. All right, so this comforter then, it actually, it's which is in you, okay? So now this comforter, okay, while um, the Lord says that he comforts those that are cast down, this comforter actually comforts you from the inside out. So this comfort is from, from the inside, inside out. So have you ever been talking to somebody and you just... You wish that you could get inside them to help them understand what it is that you're thinking so that they could have a change of mind or a change of heart about a subject. And you can't. That's kind of like what it was whenever Jesus was on the earth. He was there. He could tell them things and they could still not understand. But this comforter and this comfort is from the inside out. Um, okay. Okay. Now the third one, does that make sense? Now the third one is the Word of God. The Word of God. Now, I didn't even notice this, but you have the Father, you have the Spirit, and guess what Jesus' name is? John 1. Revelation 19. And verse 13 says that his name is the word of God okay so anyway the word of God is the next one now we're gonna find some things Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 Romans 15 and verse 4. And if you haven't noticed already, we got nine sources of comfort, and each of these are the sources in the top, and then you have verses that show you and help you to understand that these things are a means in which God comforts us. So Romans 15 and verse 4. What does that say? For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So he says, whatsoever was written aforetime, okay, whatsoever was written, was written, what was that, what was the rest of it? For our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. For our learning that we, through patience, okay, so this is what we need, we learn, and then through patience and comfort of the scripture, comfort of the scripture. Okay, so then the, the scripture, it comforts us. Okay, the Old Testament, it's written for our learning, for patience, 
for in the comfort of the scripture. So we find comfort in what God has said. God, this is the only thing that God left us with is what he has said. And we find comfort in his words. We don't know anything about God apart from this book. And apart from what he has said, there's nothing true about God. What he said is found in his word, and the truth of God is found in the book. And it just so happens that the book has a name. Jesus <clears throat> is called the word of God. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15 to 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, what did I say, 15 to 18, 15 to 18, okay, all right, what's that say? For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Among other words in the Bible, one of the things that the Lord gives us in specific he says, comfort one another with these words, is that everyone that has died in Christ, that trusted what Jesus did, he died for their sins, he was buried and he rose again the third day, though they are dead, though their spirit has left their body, and they were buried, one day, <clears throat> the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So everyone that is dead in Christ is going to rise whenever Jesus Christ comes back. Um, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So if somebody has died, they are going to resurrect. They're going to be with Jesus. If you don't die before the rapture, you are going to go up. You're going to meet him in the air. And then guess what? So shall you ever be with the Lord. Amen. So he says, comfort one another with these words. Okay? So it is a comfort to hear the words in specific that whenever a loved one dies, it's not only not over, but you're going to see them again in Christ. So they got a comfort from this, from the word of God. Now, four, that is weird. I didn't put that together at all. Okay, the number four is preaching and prophesying. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3. First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3 says, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Okay, so preaching and prophesying. Okay, that's 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 3. It is for edification, for exhortation, and for comfort. So the only reason, well, one of the reasons why somebody gets up and the Bible calls it the foolishness of preaching to try to basically make a speech, try to tell people about things about God, is for edification to build you up in the body of Christ and your understanding of God's word, exhortation would mean like what we did here where God comforts you so that we can comfort other. That's exhorting you to do something. And then comfort is the whole thing that we're talking about. That you would be comforted by the fact that God's word says comforteth us in all our tribulation, whether we feel it or not. He's coming for us. Um, 
he comforts those that are cast down. Now, so, so this was preaching and prophesying are to comfort us. Okay, so there's a comfort in hearing somebody get up and speak God's word so that it can help your spirit because that's what that's how God communicates with us. Now, verse 31 in the same chapter, verse 31. It says, he says, for you, you may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. So then, learn. So the purpose of, one of the purposes of preaching and prophesying, you know, I'm, I'm technically prophesying whenever I'm saying that whenever you're in the distresses of life and you're despairing even of life, God's coming for you and he's going to comfort you. I'm speaking the future. This is where you're at. This is what God's going to do. So it's to learn. He says that all may learn. What did that say? Verse 31. That all may learn and all may be comforted. All may be comforted. Now, I mean, preaching and prophesying is for learning and for comfort. It's for other things, but right there he tells us, learn and comfort it. You know, because you can't be comforted by God if you have... Um, misunderstandings about who God is. If you don't think that he cares about your tribulation, if he doesn't care that your life is not is not is a hard thing, if he doesn't care about your distresses, then you definitely don't think that he's coming for you because you think he doesn't care. That's why we learn things about the Lord so that we can believe the word of God and so that we can be comforted because that's what he's doing. He's going to try to comfort so, <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter oh wait, Second Corinthians chapter one and verse twenty four. And these honestly, these things, while they're very practical, it's very hard whenever you're in a hard um, season of life many times to feel the comfort of God. Just know that that's where He's at. He comforteth those that are that are cast down. Second um, Corinthians one verse. 24, what's that say? Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but we are helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. Okay, so then preaching and prophesying is to be a helper of your joy. Okay, he says, not that we have dominion over your faith, but we're helpers of your joy. So one of Paul's purposes was to be a helper of somebody's joy. It would be a comforting thing if we could actually believe that whenever we're in the distresses of life, that God was coming for us in all of them, and he wanted to comfort us. But it's hard to believe that whenever we're having a hard time. So comforter, or um, helpers of your joy, that was 2 Corinthians one twenty four. Okay. Now, the love of Christ. Okay, so this is number. I'm going to erase this. Number five. Philippians chapter one. For chapter two, verse one. Two, one. Yes. Yes. If there if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Um, so he says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ if any comfort of love. OK, 
Okay, there's comfort of love in Christ. Okay, comfort of love. Two verse one. Now notice he said, thinking about the distresses of life, in that same verse he said, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, implying there's a massive amount of consolation in Christ. Consolation in the Noah Webster 1828 says that it's an alleviation of misery. If there be any alleviation of misery in Christ, implying that there's plenty of alleviation of misery in Christ. But if we don't believe the right thing about what we think that God cares about and doesn't care about as far as our life is concerned, we're probably not going to believe that. But he says that there's a comfort of love and there's an alleviation of misery. Okay, so we got a comfort of love. Now, this love is conditional or unconditional? It's unconditional. <laughs> Amen. Unconditional. Why? Why is it unconditional? Yeah, why is it unconditional? Because it's based on Christ and not ourselves. Right. See, whenever we got in Christ, whenever we trusted what Jesus did, we were, we're in the Son. We're bone of his bone. We're flesh of his flesh. We're in Christ. So then all Christ's merit was then imputed to us. Not because we're good. We're not good. We're terrible. But in Christ, there's an unconditional comfort of love. Not based on anything that we did. Based on everything that he did. So then this love is something that is, is going to comfort regardless of our performance. There's not a condition to this love because it is in Christ. If we were outside of Christ, we have a conditional love. For God so loved the world. He loved you enough to die for you. But if you're not in Christ, whenever you die, you'll end up getting what you deserve. But here you got an unconditional comfort. Of love, so then this love is the comfort. So love is an aspect that God comforts us. Now, this is unconditional, not based on your performance, but based on His. Go to Ephesians four thirty two. This is one of my favorite verses. If I get to my deathbed and I actually figure out how to apply it, it'd be amazing. Four verse thirty two. 432, favorite phrase in all the Bible. What's it say? And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Okay, he just told us to do some things. And the reason why he told you to do some things is answered in the verse. What does he say? Even as Christ, for, um, Christ. For, God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Okay, so watch this. God, for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake. That means because of Christ. All him, not me. I'm forgiven because of Christ. I'm not forgiven because of me. I'm for, he says, God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you I am forgiven because of what Jesus did God for Christ's sake has forgiven you this doesn't necessarily have this has to do with the expression of the comfort that we would find because we're not worthy we don't deserve forgiveness we don't deserve for God to be kind to us we don't deserve anything the application and the expression of you receiving the comfort of love from God in Christ is that you be kind one to another, regardless if somebody's a wretch. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, tender-hearted, whether they are calloused, cold, doesn't matter. Kind, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Well, they don't deserve, of course, you don't either. 
For Christ's sake. He says the whole reason why you would want to do this is for Christ's sake. God forgave you because of him in spite of you. You're forgiven because Christ pleased God. So be kind one to another, tenderhearted. Forgiving one another as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. So you've got to remember, you're not saved because you did something great. You're saved because Jesus hung on a cross for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And God offers you unconditional love and comfort of love in Christ in spite of you not deserving it. So then we want to offer people kindness, tenderheartedness, and we want to forgive people because we're not forgiven, he's not kind, and he's not tender with us because we deserve it. We, he's tender, he's kind, and he forgives us because Jesus deserved it. Amen. Make sense? Now, so this thing's under unconditional. This comfort of love's unconditional. Check this out. I'll show you. Uh, Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, verse 35 to 39. Romans 8, 35 to 39. 8, 35 to 39. What's it say? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs> Alright, so who can separate us from the love of God in Christ? Nobody. Nobody. Not even the devil himself can separate you from the love of Christ. So then is this comfort of love conditional upon your performance? Nope. Is it conditional on the circumstances not going to pot, you know, and you, you being a, having a bad day, you know, and getting bent out of shape and not being kind to God and not being kind to anybody else? No. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So this comfort is not because of you, and it's not because it's actually in spite of you, it's because of him. And it's unconditional. It's unconditional. Very, very um, important to understand that. Now, number six. Um, Psalm 23, verse 4. Twenty-three and verse four. What does it say? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. God has a rod and he's got a staff, and the Bible says that they comfort the psalmist. Okay, so he says, Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. Okay, now. In John 16, verse 13, well, which was right there, the Bible says that he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit, which is the comforter, God uses a rod and a staff here, and it says that they comfort me. Okay, John 16, Verse 13 says the Holy Spirit guides us. Okay, a rod and a staff, whenever used in a, in a, in a farm setting, they, they, they keep the sheep where they need to be. So then here, the Holy Spirit guides us. Okay, so then the shepherd would guide. I'm taking some liberty here. Obviously, this is not a doctrinal statement. But 
the reality is, is that it has to do with comforting and we have comfort of the scriptures. This is the scripture, Psalm chapter 23, verse 4. So the Holy Spirit that, gives, that God gave to us is a guide to us. Now the Bible says that the Holy Spirit teacheth comparing spiritual with spiritual. Whenever you compare spiritual with spiritual, you will come to the conclusions that sometimes the Bible says the same thing in different places. You put them, you, you, you allow them to give you a better understanding. Then sometimes the Bible says different things, and then you understand that that's contrast. Well, rightly dividing, 1 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing, these are the guardrails. Whenever we're reading our Bible. So the comforter is given to us to guide us. He says that he's going to um, compare spiritual with spiritual. That has to do with the word. And he divides. He keeps us on track with the rod and the staff through the guardrails. Obviously took some liberty with that. But anyway, God's got a rod and a staff. We've got to stay between the lines in order to be... Um, to be on the right track now number seven number seven is our well, it's not our favorite but it's a help food genesis chapter 18 and verse 5 genesis chapter 18 and verse 5 what does that say and I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts, after that ye pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, Do so as thou hast said. So, in the beginning of verse 5, he says, I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. If something happens to a person's heart, whenever they're given food. Okay? So, Genesis chapter 18 and verse 5 says that food is tied to comfort. How many of you guys have eaten something and it has felt really good? It just food has a tendency a good meal it makes you feel good. Mm -hmm. Makes you feel good and, and it tastes good, which is pretty cool. Comfort food. Comfort food. Okay? Mm -hmm. They say comfort food. Okay, now, so, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. So God, he gives us food. It's a very tangible thing. He gives us food, and he allows that to be a comfort for us. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4. The Bible says, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. And then he says, If thou put the, bre the brethren in the remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So he said, every creature of God, that has to do with food, okay? If you didn't know, um, a lot of food that we eat are animals that are dead, and you, you cook them. So, he says, every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. So, this thing right here, food being a comfort in the Christian's life is tied to your thanksgiving for it. It's very important for us to be thankful to God for what he provides for us to eat. He provides only other, among other reasons, but he provides it because it, it's a comfort. It's something that we need, and whenever we have a good meal, it's a, it's a comfort to us. But what he says is that you can eat anything you want, nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. So we want to be thankful for it. So that's First Timothy chapter four, verse four. Food is a comfort. Comfort food. Now, number eight. Number eight is people.
First Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 22. First Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 22. Seven and verse twenty-two. What does that say? And Ephraim, the father, their their father, mourned many days, and his brethren came to comfort him. All right. So, how many times, whenever something happens, people come and they came and they to comfort. Him, okay, so you see a person being people being sent to comfort that person now first Chronicles chapter 19 verse 2 first Chronicles 19 and verse 2 did I say Corinthians 19 and verse 2 What's that one say And David said I will show kindness unto Hanan the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me, and David sent messengers to comfort him concerning his father. So the servants of David came into the land of the children of Ammon to Hanan to comfort him. Bam! So to comfort him. So people are sent to comfort people. Even in even in real life, that happens. You you go and you comfort somebody. Now, 1st Timothy, 3 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. 1st Thessalonians chapter 5, we're almost done. Chapter 5, verse 10 and 11. Go ahead and read that one. 10 to 11? 10 to 11. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Notice there he said, comfort yourselves together. He didn't say one guy, make sure that you're in charge of comforting people concerning death. He says, comfort yourselves together. Why? It's pretty easy to spare of life, and all of us have got to be on the same page that, hey, whenever I'm down, you comfort me. Whenever you're down, you com I comfort you. Whenever people are down, we comfort them. So he says to comfort yourselves together. Now, the last one on this one is 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 6. What's that one say? Seven verse six. Yes. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforteth us by the coming of Titus. All right, so again, God comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. So then what would that tell us about how God is going to send comfort to people sometimes? He's going to send others yeah. to them. So he's going to use people. God uses people to comfort people. And it's amazing, though, see, because we think about that. We think, okay, yeah, God could use me to comfort somebody. But we don't think about it like God is actually comforting somebody through me. And, and that is, so, so we can comfort others. We can be God's comfort. Be God's comfort to people. It can be God's comfort to people. Now, the last one is number nine. Psalm 119 and verse 52. 
Psalm 119 and verse 52. He says, I remembered thy judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. Okay, so here the Bible says that we can you can comfort yourself. Now, in looking at that verse, how how would you comfort yourself? Um, what verse was it again? Um, it's 50, 52. Remembering his judgments of old. Damn. Okay, so then that goes back to this comfort of the scriptures, and you're you're bringing to mind what God has said, and then whenever it seems like there's no comfort anywhere else, you're drawing for what God's already said. And then you're able to bring comfort to yourself. How often does it seem like there's no comfort anywhere? We know that there is, but how often does it seem that way? So comfort yourself. That's um, Psalms 119 verse 52. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 30 verse 6, it's our last verse. 1 Samuel 30, verse 6. 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. If I can find it. 30, verse 6. What's that say? And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord with God. In this case, something that David did caused a lot of people's family members to die. And it, there was no comfort anywhere because everybody was impacted by what David did. So the Bible says that he encouraged himself... What did he say? That he encouraged himself in the Lord with God. You know, there are going to be days whenever it seems like there's not a lot to draw from and sometimes you have to encourage yourself in the Lord. And that's, that's the reality. So, nine sources. Now remember, you know, the reality is, is that he does, he comforts us in all tribulation. So God is coming for us in our tribulation. But as a human being, many times we don't think that he's near. So nine sources of comfort. God the Father comforts. He's he, um, God who comforteth those that are cast down. If you're cast down, God desires to comfort. The Holy Spirit is called the comforter. The word of God. Um, we have comfort of the scriptures, preaching and prophesying. Learn that all may be comforted. Any purpose for preaching is that people be comforted. The love of Christ is unconditional. And we have comfort of this love that we do not deserve. It's because of him. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. He was perfect. We are not perfect or something seriously wrong with us. He died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. You are forgiven. Half, past tense, forgiven you. And that's why you should be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. God's rod and his staff comfort us. Food comforts us. That's where you get comfort food. People comforts, comfort other people. And we can comfort people in Christ, and we can be God's comfort to people. And you can comfort yourself and encourage yourself in the Lord. Any questions? All right. Hope you guys have a good day.